board. There you go. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, I'm sure people have been thinking about this all week. Um, we're uh, dealing with two different uh, um, cases or two different types of uh, treating the uh, affliction of tsara'at. Um, so there's a person who's definitely a mitzora. The priest looks at this person who has this skin affliction and says, yep, that's exactly what the Torah says that, uh, that tsara'at looks like. You've got definitely a case of tzara'at, and that person then has to go through the whole rigmarole of being very, very severely ritually impure, uh, sent out of the camp, um, has to wait for, the, for the, uh, the symptoms to go away, and then is purified with an elaborate set of uh, rituals. But there's another type, uh, uh, another situation where a person has some kind of skin affliction. They come to the priest, well, there are three. And a priest looks at the person and says, sorry, this is not sara'at. This is a rash of some kind, whatever it is. It could be any kind, it should be psoriasis or, or some other terrible thing or, it's, or some not terrible thing, it doesn't matter. And the priest goes, this is none of my business. Go to a doctor and refuah shlema. And that's it. Um, then there's the intermediate case where the priest looks at the uh, uh, phenomenon and says, it's not clear to me yet whether you have tsara'at or not. And that person is then put in quarantine to see whether the uh, affliction develops the full clear symptoms of, tsaru, of tsara'at or not. And it could go either way. The person could end up becoming then after the seven days and it could go even another seven days, um, could, be, could be declared by the priest to be um, a mitzora, right? Uh, or the priest could say, no, these, they, they look suspicious, but now it, it's not that case and you're not a mitzora. But the Torah says, uh, the, as we understand it, that even in such a case, the person needs to become ritually uh, uh, cleansed, uh, even though it's not a, a case of, of full uh, tzara'at. So the Mishnah that we have that started already on 8B1 at the bottom of the page is dealing with what's the difference? Ain bain. There's no difference between A and B except C, right? What's the difference between this kind of a, a person who has tentative tzara'at, let's call it, and, uh, um, and, and the person who has def, def, definite tzara'at? What's the difference? The answer is there is no difference. We treat even the person with tentative tzara tzara'at as, as a mitzora, except for letting their hair grow and rending their garments. They don't have to do that. And then the discussion in the, in the, in the Gemara is uh, on two levels. First of all, what's the scriptural basis for making these distinctions? And second of all, when we do read out this, these scriptural uh, things, how do we uh, understand all of the other details of the, uh, the syndrome of tsara'at, both in terms of the status of the person as he's enduring this affliction, and then the exit strategy for, for going out. In both, in both of those uh, um, uh, fields, uh, what, how do we understand this? And then at the end of the Mishnah, it says there's no difference be in becoming ritually pure, except that the tentative mitzora does not need to shave all of their body hair off, and they don't have the procedure of the birds, um, where uh, they're mixed in with the with the blood and the and the uh, and the water and the and the hyssop and so on. Um, that doesn't happen uh, to the to the tentative person. Okay, so that's the Mishnah, and we started reading the Gemara, and we started getting. Um, um, explanations about how, when we read the various verses in the Torah, we derive these kinds of distinctions. And then we say, well, but why, maybe we should, maybe that's a little arbitrary. Maybe we could make the distinction differently. And so we start arguing back and forth, what makes more sense and how do you decide, um, you know, which way to go. 
And of course, that parallels the discussion that we had in the previous Mishnah, which talked about differences with, with regard to a person who had genital emissions and how we distinguish one from the other. And, and we saw that it was a combination of exegesis and um, uh, argumentation. So we have the same thing as well. Okay. So now, um, where did we end up? Right, According to my notes at the end of the first paragraph of the Gemara on the left-hand column on 8b2. At the end of the, at 8b2 at the end of where? First paragraph, left-hand column. So we Right after the it. large Gemara. The Mishnah states, etc. At the end of that paragraph, the Gemara inquires. Oh, I thought we went further than that. Okay, so good. All right, so you know what? So we might as well just start from the, from the Gemara itself. Okay. okay, we'll start from there. Okay, who would like to read for us, please? Go I will. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Gamara. Okay. Gamara. The Mishnah states that letting the hair grow and rending the garments is the only difference between a confirmed and a confined mitzora. But with regard to sending the mitzora out of the city walls and all the stringencies of Tuma that apply to a mitzora, both this confirmed mitzora and this confirmed confined Mitzora are identical. Okay, so the Mitzora has to be thrown out of the sacred camp. Um, there's a note that that clarifies something that is a little bit of uh, perhaps of interest. That's note 15, because of course the Torah this details these rules when the camp was a very, very clearly defined uh, uh, situation, right? That there was this vast wilderness, you know, we're, we're wandering around for 40 years um, and the, there's nothing all around us, and then we encamp, and our camp is very easy to, to distinguish between what's the camp and what's not the camp. So when the Torah says the person has to dwell outside the camp, in the wilderness situation, it's very clear. But uh, um, because we had a very, very, uh, uh, you know, def def defined setup. All these three tribes are on the north. These three tribes are in the east. These three tribes are on the south. These three tribes are on the west. That's the 12 tribes. The Mishkan, the, the tabernacle is in the middle. The Levites and the priests are, are, are circling the inner core of the, uh, of, the, um, of the Mishkan. By the way, just as a terrible uh, association, they are the security guards to prevent the sacred precincts of the sanctuary from being uh, um, trespassed by people from the outside. Something that we failed to do last week um, in, in our own sacred uh, precincts. Um, the, the, the security guard um, was clearly not interested in preventing uh, a, a desecration of the secular sacred ground of our capital. Um, but the Levites are in charge of preventing anybody from coming into the sanctuary who is not entitled to. And that's part of this ritual impurity part. If you're ritually impure, you're not allowed to get into the sanctuary, no matter how much you want to. Okay, so back to here. So let's look at note 15, which asks or details how the rabbis then extrapolated from the wilderness experience to when we ended up living in the land of Israel. When we, linda, when we ended up living in the land of Israel, we have this big country. Well, it's not a very big country, but relative to the encampment in the desert, it's a big country. And we've got all these tribes living all over the place to the north and the south and so on. Um, the Mishkan is no longer in the center of the country. Um, how, do we, how do we transfer this idea of encampment um, into a uh, real life situation where you've got people in towns and, and farms and villages and cities all over up and down the coast. Um, how do you define encampment in such a way, in such a situation? So 15. Note 15. In the wilderness, the desert habitation of Israel was divided into three camps. The camp of the divine presence, the tabernacle area, the camp of the Levites, where the Levites resided, and the camp of the Israelites, where the rest of the nation was encamped. Right. So just as I mentioned before, these are concentric circles. Mm -hmm. The tabernacle, the Mishkan, 
is at the center. And then the Levites are on all four sides around as a thin, thin blue wall, thin blue line um, around the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And then, and the tabernacle area itself is a rectangular, uh, 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 you know, uh, set up. And then there are four uh, sides around that rectangle, a bigger rectangle. Uh, and that's where the tribes of Israel are, uh, are allocated space uh, on each side. So that's the three concentric areas. Various forms of Tumah required the Tameh to be sent out of the first two camps, but he was allowed in the camp of the Israelites. Only a Metzorah was banished from all three camps, according to Leviticus and then Rashi's interpretation. These camp divisions apply in Eretz Yisrael as well. The Temple and Temple Mount area <clears throat> comprised the camps of the Divine Presence and of the Levites, and all cities walled in the time of Joshua, <coughs> excuse me, correspond to the camp of the Israelites. Thus, a Mitzorah is banished from all these walled cities. Okay, so this is from a Mishnah someplace else. Okay, so it becomes different. It's, it's, it's a different situation. We don't have um, people dwelling in specific areas that make that dwelling place identified as one part of the camp or not, but it actually becomes identifiable areas. The temple itself is now the heir to the tabernacle. The, the, the constructed temple, first temple and second temple. And then the temple mount, which is the courts, the courtyards around the temple. The temple itself was an area that, again, nobody could go in there except for the priests. So that was the temple. Then there were courtyards outside for people to watch the, the rituals, both on, the, on the, uh, the festivals, on Yom Kippur, and so on and so forth, where people came to watch what was going on. And then you had uh, um, outside of that walled cities, which meant that you had dots of this camp. You could have like a whole miles of, of an area and then come back into that very sanctified uh, area. And a Mitzorah could not be in any of those places. So the Mitzorah was kicked out of all three places. Uh, when we read the, the, the prophetic uh, readings, the Haftarot, for Tazria and Mitzora, we read about um, Mitzoraim sitting on the at the out, uh, outside the walls of Jerusalem. They're right there. The wall is here, and they're leaning against the wall, but they can't go into the city. They're outside the city. Okay, so that's where that's uh, that's the idea. So now, what 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 the back to the Gemara? What the Gemara says is, guess what? Even we'll call this a tentative because confined and can and can and what's the other one? Confirmed is too confirmed. similar. Last week we were getting uh, we were reading them and we're getting all confused. So the tentative mitzora also is thrown out of these three sacred encampments. Yes, Stuart. Um, just a quick question. I mean, there's always a question about which temple era laws carry over into the post-temple period. What about here? I mean, the... By the time like the, a, by the, yes, by the time the rabbis are around, there is no tzara, no, no mitzorah at all. So somebody who has these symptoms is just not, it's not an issue anymore? The you don't, you are, not a, you are, you are not, a, you are not a mitzorah unless the priest declares you a okay. mitzvah. Once the temple is destroyed, the priest's jobs are, are uh, uh, pretty much falling by the wayside. It takes a little bit of time. Right. But by the time you have the established rabbinic culture, there is no institution of Mitzora anymore. So, so someone who has these symptoms would just... Nobody knows what those symptoms are. Okay. They're, they're just defined as sick people. Okay. And, and that's part of the, the power of the legal system. The, the Torah specifically indicates you're not a Metzora unless the priest says you're a Metzora. And, uh, um, you know, but the, and here we have this liminal situation where the priest says, I'm not quite sure you're a Metzora. But that's, so that's enough to kick in this quasi-Metzora status, but the priest has to do it. 
I mean, sometimes the Sanhedrin can take that take over roles that the priests. The, choice, the choice was not to. That's what I'm saying. The, right. the the choice was historically to say this is a dead letter. Okay. Or or but that's the wrong word because actually what they what they said was it's a living letter, because we're going to study this like crazy, but we're not going to put it into practice. Okay. So the Gemara inquires, from where are these things known? Where does scripture indicate that the requirements to let the hair grow and to rend the garments do not apply to a confined mitzvah? Right. So, and as I mentioned at this point uh, I, more than once, but I certainly last week I did it also, this is part of the agenda of the Gemara. Take all of these complicated laws and tie them, even if it's with the thinnest string, Mm. Tie them back to scripture. Take the oral Torah, take the living lived Torah and the traditions and the discussions and all of that. Take it and find a way to pin it back to the written word. Okay, so that's what the Gemara now says. Let's see you do this. The Gemara says, can you do this? Can you put, can you bring this back into that other, uh, um, into the Torah as it's written? Now, the way that they do it is they do it then, therefore, that's where it comes from, right? Mina Hanimili, where do these things come from? So even though I'm presenting it as, okay, now let's take these laws and let's tie a string back to the Torah, which is what they actively do. But by tying the string back to the Torah, what they are claiming is that they are showing you the derivation from the Torah outward. Right by they're revealing that this has been actually the flow. The flow is not from us into the Torah. The flow has been from the Torah out to us. Okay. Uh, the Gemara replies, as Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak taught in a Baraita in the presence of Rav Huna, the verse states regarding a confined Mitzorah who is becoming cleansed. Then the Kohen shall declare him Tahor. It is a Mispachat. He shall immerse his garments and he has been cleansed. This implies that he is cleansed even initially from the requirements of letting his hair grow and rending his garments. Okay, so let's just uh, read this a little bit more slowly, mm -hmm. right? The, the verse says. The verse when, states. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. One more time. For my then, the Ko then the Kohen shall declare him Tahor. It is a mispachat. 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 Mispachat, he shall immerse his garments and he has been cleansed. This implies that he is cleansed even initially from the requirements of letting his hair grow and rending his garments. Okay, so, and therefore what? So how does this prove anything? Right, how do we know that, that uh, um, the hair growing does not apply to a tentative mitzorah? It just says he immerses his garments and has been cleansed. Doesn't say anything about the, about the, the hair. It seems to be because this verse of the priest uh, purifying him is after the stages go by where this is a definite mitzora who is clearly confirmed as a mitzora and therefore he has to do the following. Okay, let's just take a look in 21. Now 21. If the verse meant only that the confined mitzora becomes tahor upon his immersion, it should have used the expression ve taher, and he shall be cleansed. Ve yitar, ve yitar. Ve y Sorry, I can't, I can't read that small print. That, that's okay, that's why we're all here together. Okay, and he shall be cleansed, which clearly indicates the future tense. The verse's use of the expression ve taher, ve taher, which can denote the past tense, can be construed to indicate that he has always been cleansed of some stringency of the tuma of Metzorah. That is, the confined Mitzorah was never subject to the requirement to grow his hair or to rend his garments. That's Rashi's interpretation. Okay, so we see that according to this uh, reading, since the peculiar uh, choice or the specific choice of the Torah was vitaher, to be read as possibly as he has always been pure, even though we're doing a purification uh, uh, ceremony, he's actually been pure in some way until now also. So the, the Gemara says, uh, this is Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak, uh, that's the indication that on the one hand, the priest has to do this 
purification ceremony. But on the other end, the Torah says, well, but Tahir, but he has actually been pure all along. So how do we, how do we uh, satisfy both of these things? He's been pure all along in that he hasn't had to let his hair grow and he hasn't had to tear his garments. Okay, the Gemara rejects this proof. The Gemara rejects this proof. Rava said to him, if so, that the word v'taher, is that what it is? V'taher implies an initial cleanse, clean, cleanness. Then in regard to Azav, where it is written, and he shall immerse his garments and immerse his flesh in spring water, and he has been cleansed, what, and he has been cleansed initially, is it possible to say there? Right, the v'taher is the used there also. The Zav is the situation we had in the previous Mishnah. So then the question is, okay, so that means that you're dividing up some aspects of purity, ritual purity and ritual impurity from each other. And you're saying that the Zav actually has, uh, if you want to say vitaher means that there is some residual purity that this person has, even though in other ways he's ritually impure, well, how are you going to apply that to a Zav, where a Zav is absolutely, definitively, completely, seriously impure? So that means that you're trying to use that word vitaher to mean that doesn't hold up. You can't say that that's really what the Torah means. Rather, the Gemara goes on, you must explain the expression, and he has been cleansed, vitaher. in the context of this verse regarding Zav, to mean that he is cleansed henceforth from the stringency of conveying Tuma to an earthenware utensil through movement. That is. So the special, the special extra stringency that's involved there, the Zav is a super, super, like a super spreader. He's, he's a very super potent, mm. ritually impure source. And this is going to take him uh, uh, out of ritual impurity into the in the future. So what Rava is saying is it's clear in the Zav that in the, in the case of the Zav, that the, that the Torah's use of the word v'taher means from now on. So you can't possibly say that the word v'taher means that it's always been a sustained situation, that he has been ritually pure in some way. Okay, we're, not, we're gonna skip over with this whole business about what kind of tumor we're talking about. Go ahead. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Uh, rather, you must explain the expression he has been cleansed in the context of this verse regarding Azav to mean he is cleansed henceforth from the strategy of conveying too much to an earthenware utensil through movement. That is, even if he again experiences an emission on the seventh clean day after his immersion, he still does not convey too much to it retroactively through movement. Here, too, okay. the context so, of. So, sorry. so, wait, just one half a second. So, then what is this future oriented? Uh, uh, statement mean? It means that we had already that you could have a Zav with two emissions and a Zav with three emissions. emissions. And the Zav with two emissions is um, less of a serious case than a Zav with three emissions, right? And that's the previous Mishnah. What's the difference between a Zav with two and a Zav with three? We're not going to go back over that. But now what Rava is saying is, since this Vitaher means into the future, what it means, therefore, is what happens on the day that the Zav immerses in the mikvah because he's only had two emissions. So he doesn't need to have the elaborate uh, uh, ritual that the Zav requires if he has three emissions. Only he, has, he only needs to go to the mikvah. But what happens if the very day that he goes to the mikvah, poof, he gets the third emission? So then do we say retroactively, that he now is a three emission guy and three strikes and he's out. And that's very, very serious. So the answer is no, no. Tahir, we, it's a reset. And once he's gone to the mikvah, even though that very same day, the day is not over yet. So in the seven day count, he, uh, he can be, he, be, he can be uh, um, if he hadn't gone to the mikvah, the third emission would count as a third emission, no. Once he goes into the mikvah, then that's it. Now we look into the future and we reset the, the, the counting. And the third emission is not a third emission. It's a first emission of a second episode. Okay. Uh, bah, bah, bah. So now by analogy, how are we going to use the word v'taher in the case of a mitzorah? Now Here we're on B3, top of the page. Here too, in the context of a confined mitzorah, the expression, and he has been cleansed, 
teaches that after the Metzorah's immersion, he is cleansed henceforth from the stringency of conveying Tuma retroactively through entering a house, even if his spot subsequently grows larger and is thus declared Tame by the Kohen. Okay, so now um, look at 26, uh, not 26, uh, 20, 20, 27, 28. 28. The numbers are too small for me. Note 28. One of a mitzvah's stringencies is that when he enters a house, any people, food, or utensils that are in the house become tame. Although scripture states only that, <coughs> excuse me, that articles in a house that is itself afflicted with tzara'at become tame, another verse states, this is the law for every tzara'at affliction and the nesek, the tzara'at of the garment and the house. This equates all forms of tzara'at and all therefore convey tuma to objects that are within uh, with them in a house. Okay, so this means that the this is what I was saying uh, when we first started talking about tzara'at. The special case of a, tzar, of a mitzora is that if he walks into the house, he has made rendered the entire space and contents of the house tame. He is the walking dead, right? If a dead person is in a house, then the, the, he, the, the, the ritual impurity of a dead person fills the house. But th this is a living person. And usually when a living person is ritually impure, the only way that they can convey ritual impurity is by touching or by moving something. But nevertheless here with a, with a mitzora, it's so serious that simply by entering the house, that uh, uh, ritual impurity then explodes, so to speak, Throughout the, throughout the house. So now the question is, how does this uh, work with regard to the tentative mitzvah? So look at 29. Uh, note 29. The Torah states that if after the Kohen pronounces the confined mitzvah free of tzara'at, the spot on his skin spreads or develops other symptoms of definite tzara'at, the Kohen thereupon declares him a confirmed mitzvah. Although it is now shown retroactively that the spot is indeed tzara'at, the Mitzorah does not convey Tuma retroactively to the objects that were with him in a house between the time of his immersion and his confirmation as a Mitzorah, though he does convey retroactively the other uh, Tumot of Mitzorah. Okay, let's Rashi. stop here for a second. So this is the analogy. Just like in the case of Azav, there's a difference between having two emissions and three emissions. So then the question is, how do we group these, these countings? If you have three emissions in the day, then or the, or two days, then then it's three emissions, and it's a very very serious case. If you only have two, then not. So at, if the mikvah immersion happens in between the second and the third uh, uh, emission, then even though it's on the same day, the mikvah immersion stops the counting, and we reset the counting. So now the same thing applies with a mitzora with the declaration of the priest. The person is a mitzora if the priest says so. The person is not a mitzora if the priest says so. So what happens if we have a person who has been a tentative mitzora, the priest wasn't sure, then he was put in confinement for seven days, quarantine. He comes out, the priest looks him over and says, you know what? You have not developed the, the symptoms of a mitzora. You're clean, you're out of the woods. And then by the afternoon, he does develop the, pre, the, the symptoms. The, the symptoms do spread and do become a full-fledged case of Mitzorah. So what do we say then? Do we say, oh, so that shows that the, you know, it just was taken a little rest for a second, but it's actually still a process that's been continuous. And this guy is a real Mitzorah. So uh, uh, from the beginning, from, from, from a week ago, the answer is no. Since the priest said, you're not a Mitzora, you're not a Mitzora. And therefore, when the, the symptoms become absolutely undeniable that you are a Mitzora, that starts from now. And it doesn't go back retroactively. So if you happen to walk into somebody's house before the, the, the symptoms became absolutely clear, we don't say that that house has become ritually impure um, and, and, and everything is okay. Right? So we start the clock from now rather than, than previously. So that's what the word vitaher means. The word vitaher is to keep us going moving forward rather than looking backwards.
Okay. So now <coughs> there's a note here in the brackets, which is a, a, a little bit of an intriguing note. Go ahead. Um, just read it for a second. Rishon Lutzio. No, you're on mute. Sorry, my dogs were carrying on before. I didn't want the barking to get in the way. Uh, anyway, Rishon Lezion, cited by Gilion Hashas, notes that these rather unusual laws of partial retroactive Tumah in the cases of Zav and Metzorah indeed emerge from the Gemara as explained by Rashi. Yet, he finds it rather surprising that such laws are not mentioned in any Mishnah or Baraita, but only by the Amora Rava. He also notes that these laws are not found in Rambam's code and that Rambam had a different version of our Gemara, according to which there was no basis for such laws. So wow. this is going back. So this is going back to the brackets in the uh, um, in the pre in the previous line, the top line of that column, where it says, "Though he does convey yeah, retroactively, retroactively the other, other tumult of Mitzorah." Right. right. We were focusing on does he um, render the house contents. Uh, uh, ritually impure? And the answer is no, that doesn't go retroactive. But uh, the implication is, but other things are retroactively, if he touched something, uh, if he sat on something, mm. things like that. So then the, then the question is, what the heck is going on here, right? How do we work with this very uh, um, seemingly self-contradictory uh, set of, of rules and situation and, and the situation itself, which is very unclear. Is this guy a Mitzora or isn't he a Mitzora? Is, is uh, you know, so is there consistency or not? So according to what we have in our Gemara, the, the way it's all uh, teased out by the text and by uh, with Rashi's help and by all of our wonderful uh, footnotes here, um, we actually have a, a complicated and a little bit self-contradictory uh, situation. So the Rishon Letzion, Rishon Letzion is actually Rabbi Chaim Ibn Atar, who is more well known as, ha as having written one of the great, great uh, uh, commentaries uh, on Chumash called Or HaChayim, and he's called the Or HaChayim HaKadosh, uh, the, 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 the saintly, sacred Or HaChayim. Um, and uh, he uh, um, is, a, is a commentary that's found in certain editions of uh, Mikra Odgedolot, that's a very spiritual commentary, but he also wrote uh, Talmudic uh, legalistic uh, uh, comments, which are less well known. So that's the Rishon Litzion here. So he, he says, what the heck is going on? And we have, um, they, it, they summarize here some of, the, uh, of, the, of his questions. Um, it's also, as he points out, this uh, way of, of looking at things is not found in the Yerushalmi. So he says, where, it, where is this coming from? Why do we have this self-contradictory set of laws? And where else is it if it's such an important, because uh, uh, it's definitely not uh, logically deducible, why isn't it mentioned anywhere else? And then he says, and it's not even codified. Um, Rambam is the code of law that codifies all Jewish law. The Shulchan Aruch does not codify this kind of stuff because it's not practicable anymore, right? The Shulchan Aruch uh, only codifies laws that are you know, abided by today, um, you know, in, in, in Jewish living. But Rambam has a codification of all of the sacrificial laws and all of the ritual impurity laws and, uh, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff and, and, and all of the legal laws that, that don't apply anymore. Um, and he has quite an extensive discussion about, about ritual impurity and about a mitzora. And he doesn't say anything about this. He should have been explicit. So it, when it says here, he also notes that these laws are not found in Rambam's code and that Rambam had a different version of our Gemara. It's not that he knows this. He says, I guess, it seems that there is some other Talmudic version as reflected, for instance, in the Yerushalmi. In the Yerushalmi, there is no uh, uh, distinction made between the Tum'ah of walking into a house and the Tum'ah of touching something. So according to the Yerushalmi, actually all of the Tum'ah is washed away. There is no Tum'ah. Once we said this guy is not a Mitzorah, he wasn't a Mitzorah. 
and that's it. But according to the way the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud that we have here, um, reads, um, uh, we have this kind of like, uh, um, you know, having our cake and eating it too. In one sense, he's, he's washed away from having been a Mitzorah. And we say, no, it never really was. And in another sense, we say, yes, it really was. He was to a certain extent. He's a halfway Mitzorah. Yeah, Sylvia. You're, you're on mute. See that. You know, most early civilizations had medicine men or people whose sole responsibility was health, med medical things, and what have you. And it seems here that the rabbis are taking that place. I mean, Rambam was a doctor, but until we get to him, what was, was there no, just, were there not some people who were particularly aware of health? So we had a little bit of a discussion before you before you tuned Sorry, in. Sorry, I was late. Yeah. So and and we this is a continuation of our discussion you and me last week. Right. So in terms of health, health is very important. It's a mitzvah to stay healthy. It's a mitzvah not to jeopardize your own health. Certainly not to make anybody else sick. You're obligated to to uh, uh, if you cause somebody else to be to be sick or hurt, you're obligated to to uh, to help them get better. All of that is medicine. As you say, Rambam was a respected and for his day, skilled physician. And that has absolutely nothing to do with this. This is a legal topic, which the rabbis delve into to the most minute degree. And, uh, you know, as I've, as, I've, as I've acknowledged, this is something that uh, for us might be a little bit challenging to keep on uh, following along. Um, but they saw it, this is a phenomenon that they completely divorced from health issues. Anybody that had skin rashes or whatever, go to a doctor, do the best that medicine can do for you. This is about a specific phenomenon that they said has nothing to do with illness. It has everything to do with a spiritual and legal uh, manifestation. I understand that, but I'm just curious whether there was in these early days of the Talmud a part of society that focused on people. Of course, yeah, they were. They were Did we hear about them. It's like they're all they're you know they're all over all over the place. You know, people are visiting each other when they're sick. They're getting uh, um, you know prescriptions for how to how to get better. Eat this, home. don't eat that, from people who know how to do it. Just like where do the medical professions get their knowledge today? But I'm just asking whether there's any any discussion of people who were specifically yeah 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 first. yeah is there yeah. In, yeah. In it's, it's interspersed all over the place. Okay. Um, all right. So, okay, duly noted uh, that we have here a strange. Uh, um, uh, situation where we're making this uh, person um, both a, a Mitzorah and not a Mitzorah, right? Okay. Um, where did we leave off in the, uh, um, yes, thus. Second paragraph, left column. Good, thus. Thus, thus the source stated in the Baraita taught by Rav Shmuel by Yitzhak for exempting a confined Metzorah from growing his hair and rending his garments is unacceptable because the expression, and he has been cleansed, does not refer to an initial cleanness. Okay, huh. so now if that's not the derivation, then we come back to our question again. So then how do we know? Yeah. How does the Mishnah know that there is this distinction to be made? And Rava is the one who destroyed our attempted uh, solution so now Rava says, okay, let me suggest a different, better answer. Go ahead. Rather, Rava said that the scriptural source for exempting a confined Mitzorah from the requirements to let, <clears throat> to let his hair grow and rend his garments is from here. The verse states, and the person in whom there is the Tzara'at affliction, his garments shall be torn, the hair of his head shall be unshorn. This implies that the only Metzorah who must grow his hair and rend his garments is one whose state of Tzarat is contingent upon his body. That is, a confirmed Metzorah, whose Tumah cannot be removed until his Tzarat heals. 
Excluded is this confined Metzora, whose state of Tzara'at is not contingent upon his body, but upon the days of his confinement. Okay. So here now we have this um, in in the in the formulation of the of the uh, Gemara, this distinction that we've been struggling with all along, right? With the confi- confirmed, the definite mitzora, this is a person who is um, physically a as I said a, a walking dead entity, and that. Uh, um, Reality is a physical reality of his body. That's who we, that's, he is that person. With the other person, it's actually not his body because we don't know what to do with his body. We don't know how to judge his body yet. We don't know how to define what he is really all about. So therefore we're waiting, right? We're gonna put this person into quarantine for a week and see if we can decide afterwards. So therefore, that distinction, says Rava, is explicitly mentioned in the Torah, where it says, asher bo hanega, that Sarua, the person who is a Mitzora, who, who in him is the affliction. It's in him. So it's clearly him that is the afflicted one. Um, with the other uh, uh, case, it's compl- it's not in him. We don't know if it's in him or not. So it's not definitive in his own uh, uh, physical uh, identity. Okay. So therefore, the determination that the Gemara, that the mission, that the Torah <laughs> says that this person should tear his clothes and shouldn't cut his hair, that's about a person Asher Bo Hanega. Only the person who is absolutely clearly a person who is afflicted, who is uh, um, bodily afflicted, but not the person who we don't know yet. Okay. Mara. Mara questions Rava's proof. Abaya said to Rava, if so, that the expression in whom implies only a confirmed Metzorah, then we should apply this verse, this as well to the verse all the days that the Sarat affliction is in him, he shall be Tame. His dwelling shall be outside the camp and interpret one whose state of Sarat is contingent upon his body. That is a confirmed Metzora. Only he needs to be sent out of the city walls. But one whose state of Sarat is not contingent upon his body, that is a confined Metzora, does not need to be sent out of the city walls. Okay. And perhaps... Wait, wait, wait. So, so Abaye says... Let's keep on reading and let's be consistent. That phrase, Asher Bo, it's in him. That is applied also when the Torah says that this Mitzorah needs to be thrown out of the camp. So that, you want to say, therefore, that it's only, according to your reading, that would then apply only to a person who is absolutely, clearly, definitely bodily afflicted as a Mitzorah. But what about the person who we're not sure about? He should not be sent out of the camp, right? So now comes the exposition that we, of course, don't need, but it's here anyway. And perhaps. You got it? No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm not quite sure where, where we are. Six, sixth line from the top on the right. On the right. Course. Okay, uh, and perhaps you will say this is indeed so that a confirmed Metzora need confined, not be sent out confined, of the city wall. Confined, confined. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 confined Metzora need not be sent out of the city walls. But it was taught differently in our Mishnah. There is no difference between a confined Metzora and a confirmed Metzora except with regard to letting his hair grow and rending his garments. This clearly implies but with regard to sending the Metzora outside the walls of the city and conveying Tuma to objects through his entering the house they are in, both this confined Metzora and this confirmed Metzora are identical. Thus we see that a confined Metzora is included in the requirement of banishment from the city, even though the verse speaks of a Metzora whose affliction is in him. This apparently disproves Rava's assertion that the expression in him refers specifically to a confirmed Metzorah, question right. mark. 
Question mark. So in other words, Abaye is bringing us back to the first paragraphs of our Gemara. First paragraph of our Gemara said, so what's going on here in the distinction between the tentative Mitzorah and the, and the definitive Mitzorah? Only tearing the clothes and, and, um, and uh, letting your hair grow. Hair grow. But, but when it comes to sending the person out of the camp, they are equal. We send them both out. So we deduce this from the Mishnah. So Abaye says, so don't play with me and say, no, no, you know what? I'm going to say that we don't send them out of the camp. We already established that the Mishnah tells us that we do send them out of the camp. Now, I, that's, so that's fine. Um, just it is, I say, a little redundant because actually we were supposed to remember this um, uh, from, from 22 seconds ago when we learned that deduction. Um, but Abaye nails it home. And I would also say that it's simply uh, 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 expressive of this paradox that we're, that we're in. A person who's, we're not sure, and yet we're applying very, very drastic um, uh, rules of, of tzara to a person who, in the end, we may end up actually deciding is not a mitzvah at all. Right? That's where we are here. Um, you know, uh, to use a terrible analogy, you know, we lock up somebody on the suspicion of murder, um, and uh, then we, we find out, uh, or let's not take murder. Murder is a little too too final. Um, let's say we they, that they that they stole money, um, and uh, you know, so they get locked up, and we confiscate their 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 assets uh, to and pay back the other person whose money got stolen, and then afterwards we finish the investigation. We decide he didn't steal the money. And we didn't give the money back. That doesn't make any sense. Either he did or he didn't. And yet, that's what we're doing here. We're, we're on the one hand, holding our determination in abeyance about whether this person really is a Mitzora. On the other hand, there are certain things that we simply say, you're a Mitzora. And, we, and we're not going to be able to, uh, uh, um, you know, to, to leave it alone. Because it certainly could have been, but the Torah doesn't allow, doesn't, and the Torah sets this up this way. It could have been that when a person is, is in a doubtful situation, then he's not, yet, you know, he's innocent until proven guilty. You know, he's ritually pure until, until proven otherwise. But that's not what the Torah says. Now we're simply just arguing about which factors we will apply and which factors we won't apply. But the Torah has already determined this person who we're not sure whether he's a mitzvah or not, we are going to apply certain rules of tzara'at to him. We're going to make uh, certain of these uh, 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 stringencies, uh, you know, apply to him no matter what. So now we have this, the guy is thrown out of the camp while we don't yet know whether he's a mitzvah. When we find out afterwards he's not a mitzvah, we say, oops. I guess you're not a Mitzorah. Welcome back. Um, but, uh, um, but until that such time, he's thrown out. Okay, hold on a second. I, there's a comment in the chat. Doesn't this make sense in terms of the super spreader possibility? Say more, Mark, please. Oh, since the idea of contagion is central to the issue, then a preemptive exclusion, given the possibility that that person could be spreading this around, makes more sense than the kind of economic situation that you described in theft. Okay, so, the, yeah, okay that's, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Right, so this brings us back to this whole question of, of as you know, as super spreader contagion and so on. The problem with that is, as I've said one way or another a number of times, is that the that the, the the contagion is only exists if it's true? If the person is determined to be a mitzora, then there is ritual impurity that can be contagious. But if the kohen says you're not a mitzora, that's what we have. Point, Rabbi. What? You're missing the point. Okay. The point is that since the possibility of contagion. If the person does in fact turn out and it's 50-50, you don't know yes or no, 
No, so but, you want but, to protect against the possibility of yes. So this is the point. So this is the point that I'm not missing. Maybe okay. the point that I'm not missing is when a person is a let's say a person comes to the priest, and the person has these uh, 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 you know skin uh, stuff. He comes to the priest. The priest says, "You are definitely a mitzora." Right. So it's clear, clear as day. This guy is a mitzora. Nothing that this person did until the priest said what he said makes anything impure. The impurity starts from when the priest tells you that you're impure. That's the point. So then it becomes super contagious and then you become a super spreader. But if the priest doesn't say that, you're not spreading ritual impurity. The ritual impurity doesn't kick in yet. That's the problem. So therefore, we have here a, a kind of a, 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 like I say, we are already granting that if you walked into a house, you, if you're a Mitzora, you render the house ritually impure just by walking in. But if subsequently you were determined not to be a Mitzora, then no. The house is not ritually impure. And even if five minutes later, you become ritually impure because it's clear now that you did become a mitzora, that house that you walked into 15, 15 minutes ago is still not ritually impure. It's not ritually impure because it wasn't declared, you weren't declared to be the super spreader. So that's the, that's the, that's the part here that's, that's very, you know, not about, we didn't, we didn't find out we didn't diagnose an illness that you had all this time. Oh, it turns out that you've been suffering from, uh, uh, you know, from this contagion for weeks. No, the pronouncement makes you at that point and from then on ritually impure. So then- That's the problem. So then it doesn't the problem that arise by the conflation of an apparent physical condition with a metaphysical judgment. Yes. And and, and, yes. and and if the symptoms didn't look like a physical symptom, then this issue wouldn't arise. Well, so not, then, no, they have to, the, phys, the, the symptoms have to look like a specific type I, of physical. I, That's I, the thing. I, right. Granted, granted. It's all but, in the judgment of the priest. Right. But, but still in all, the fact that there's a physical symptomology that is to be judged confutes two levels of judgment. And so the problem with, you know, I've been sitting now for a couple of weeks listening to this stuff. The problem <laughs> that, 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 sympathy. Been, that has been bothering me all along is this bizarre conflation of something that seems like an illness that in turns, that turns out to be some really bizarre thing that can apply to walls of houses and clothes. And so I really wonder what's going on with this. And, and so I don't think you can forget Sylvia's basic premise that this is a kind of primitivism. This is a kind of magicalism that, that, that you know, and by trying to hold the Torah up to some kind of rational critique, all of a sudden this starts to fall apart because the root of this is this weird kind of magical thinking. So, so I, I, I wouldn't uh, disagree that it's very weird and it sounds, and it is, looks like magical thinking. What I wanna bring up as the problem is it's confined to this particular weird instance. The Torah does not, the Torah specific, that's the, the Torah puts itself into this weird place here and only here. That's what I keep on trying to say, that the Torah is not saying, okay, all skin abrasions, all skin uh, uh, rashes, we better watch out, you know, or something like that. No, it's saying, guess what? We have, we, we are empowering this, you want to call him a shaman, you want to, you want to use all the, you know, the anthropological and, and, and primitivistic uh, vocabulary that you want, but that's the problem. The problem, it doesn't fit into any of these easily uh, uh, understandable 
uh, uh, cultural uh, phenomena. The priest is empowered with making a, a decision about something that you and I will simply say, this looks the same to me. And in, and in one case, he'll say, no, it's, it's sick, go to the doctor. And in the second case, he'll go, no, this is actually, um, you know, Tara'at, which has all of God's, uh, um, you know, uh, rules that apply to it. So yes, it's really weird. It's absolutely very, very, very weird. I'm going to give you an example. He brought up the houses. So this is something, again, every time we study this, when we get to the Torah readings, we bring this up. The, the priest needs to determine, does this house have mold and mildew? Or does this house have tzara'at? Right, because this is a, something that affects not just the human being's skin, it affects different surfaces. It affects the clothing that a person wears, it affects the, the walls of a person's home. So the Torah describes, the priest is gonna be invited into your home to see whether or not your house has some kind of ridiculous, uh, like I say, mold, or whether it's actually tzara'at. So the Torah says, take out everything from the house. Before the priest goes in and, and says what it is, take everything out of the house. Because anything in the house, once the priest makes his determination, if the priest decides it really is tzara'at batim, if the priest decides that this is really the divine affliction of, of, tzaru, of tzara'at on the house, anything in the house is ritually impure. So therefore, take everything out of the house before he gets in there. So three seconds before the priest determines that this is tzara'at in the house, I finally take out uh, the candlesticks. Guess what? The fact is that the 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 mold the, the 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 you know the the discoloration all that stuff it was there it's been there for the last three days. Nevertheless, the candlesticks are ritually pure if they weren't in the house when the priest says those words. Okay, let me try one more shot. <laughs> this is all consistent with the whole idea of talking magic. Correct. It goes all the way back to you know if if. Itzhak is, is tricked into saying the words to the right guy, to the wrong guy, then it's the words that count. So this has to do with this whole level of magical thinking that's at the basis of the whole idea of pronouncement that has so, so that I think is So that's very, very important, that this is in the end about speech itself. And that's why when the rabbis say that tzara'at is really a divine punishment for the misuse of speech. I think they're understanding a very profound element of this and then turning it out of magic into uh, you know, morals. But the, again, the Torah in many ways, God creates the world. Baruch said it yesterday in, 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 on, in the Shabbos, Baruch she'amar ve'a'olam, God speaks the world into being words have tremendous power potentially certainly the words of the torah have potential you know potentially powerful uh, uh consequences but the answer in the end is well yes and no most of the time what we talk about is is uh, completely meaningless the torah doesn't say every single word that you do that you say you know has has uh, those kinds of consequences so the same thing that it has limited, it has completely domesticated this speech magic into one tiny little phenomenon. It can be then used as a springboard for us to think about it and to maybe draw lessons from for our own living, which is what the rabbis wanted us to do. But in terms of a cultural uh, reality, it does not apply all over the place. That's the limitation that the Torah has done. It has fenced in this magical thinking to a very, very localized, specific instance, which just seems to make it worse. It makes it more weird, you know, because we would like to either go all or nothing. Let, let, the, let the whole culture be, you know, totally primitively, magically uh, uh, enchanted. 
or let the Torah be, uh, you know, completely demythologized and, and rational and, and, and so on. And uh, instead, what we have is we have, you know, this and this. Yeah. But saying that it, that it, that it becomes part of that magical system, in the end, doesn't take away the weirdness. David. It, there I am. Okay. Um, it, it occurs to me that it, it's, it's curious to me that, but uh, I'll just say it. It, it. it could occur, I think, that somebody has survived. He has it. And he declines to go to the uh, the uh, the levy. He walks around oh, with the Kohen, the Kohen, the Kohen. Pardon me. Um, and and he walks around with it for a couple of weeks, and he self cures, and he's been in his house. He's been in his mother in law's house. He's been, God knows where, touches people, touches things, and he self cures, and uh, the issue never. Uh, of never right. arises because he hasn't been to the priest. You're right. You're absolutely right. This will only happen if the person who is affected by this phenomenon feels the need to go to the priest and, and partake in this system. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah Sylvia. I'm trying to think if I were looking at this, you know, sort of a first uh, question, first impression, and I was reading wherever this comes up in Leviticus or wherever it is, perhaps, again, I'm taking a rational approach here, perhaps there are areas where they don't, they don't understand what's going on. There are many areas of daily life where medicine coal you know you have a cold you have a this you have a that it's understood it's it's been around it's understood the prog the the progress of the disease is understood and it's 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 manageable and then this thing they just don't understand i'm hearing you i just have i want to go find another book so i'm listening go ahead covid19 without without the the uh researchers at moderna and pfizer Un not understood. When you don't understand something, you have only one choice. You have to have a leap of faith. And perhaps that's where we get to these bizarre situations. Um, what can I say? I think that uh, this is a... Uh... I could just, you know, there are those people in the world, I'm sure, who are going to say that that COVID came upon us because humankind deserved it for one reason or another. Plagues are always are always described in those terms. I'm gonna. Um, I I think. Look, there's there's a, a long honorable history of that line of thought. Um, I think that what I was trying to say a second ago um, comes back to that. This is not the only mysterious thing in in uh, in biblical living. So the idea that this is a product of uh, of the people just not being able to cope with uh, um, with a particular phenomenon, there's a zinian phenomena that could be either mysterious or not. Um, so I, I don't think there's a unified you know total theory that that explains this stuff. Um, wait, there's there's more notes here that I've missed. So first of all, Jen, if your head hurts, um, please uh, get yourself some something good to, to, to drink or eat and, and, and so on. I'm missing all of these things. Here, Stuart, I'm gonna, so bear with me for a second. Are people with symptoms supposed to turn themselves into the priest for inspection? The answer is yes. What happens if they don't? The answer is nothing. Can their concerned neighbors turn them in? No. Um, Although, you know, again, you know, in Why terms not? of, they, it, it doesn't have legal standing. They don't have standing. The person has to do it. However, look, we know in terms of community pressure and stuff that uh, these things can definitely make a difference, you know, and that's part of actually what the rabbis said is actually happening here, right? That there's a, a, uh, a person who is creating a social uh, dysfunction or or some kind of social uh, um, uh, malady, 
And therefore he's being singled out in a certain way so that people will know and that he will know that that's not right. So, you know, peer pressure um, is not a legal uh, mechanism, but it certainly is a sociological mechanism. So, uh, um, the, but, but in terms of uh, if the neighbor goes to the priest and says, so-and-so has stuff that looks like tzara'at, sorry, that the priest simply says, you have no standing here. You know, when, when the person will come to me, that's when I'll deal with it. So um, then we have uh, Jen's note about her head. So uh, feel better. Next, so the person in David's example, which is also Stuart's example, the person who, who's walking around uh, oblivious or you know, definitely not uh, playing the game, playing by the rules, um, didn't really have it because the priest never declared it so. Correct. Right. Um, Mark Weinstein says, right. So we agree about something. So thank you. Um, and then I'm also curious about the neighbors and stewards, etc. Is there more? Wait. Question. So I think I just addressed that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, for the la last few minutes, what I'm going to do is thankfully I found um, an English translation ready made, so I didn't have to do it myself. Um, our supreme rationalist, uh, Maimonides, who, as I mentioned before, codifies all of the laws of leprosy, quote unquote leprosy, tsara'at. So he ends his a uh, very extensive treatment of this section with the following statement. Um, so bear with me. Tsara'at is a comprehensive term covering sundry incompatible matters. Thus, whiteness in a man's skin is called tsara'at. The falling off of some of his hair on his head or the chin is called tsara'at. Change of color in garments or in houses is called tsara'at. Now this change in garments and in houses which scripture includes under the general term tzara'at was no normal happening, but was a portent and a wonder among the Israelites to warn them against slanderous speaking. For if a man uttered slander, the walls of his house would suffer a change. If he repented, the house would again become clean. But if he continued in his wickedness until the house was torn down, Leather objects in his house on which he sat or lay would suffer a change. If he repented, they would again become clean. But if he continued in his wickedness until they were burned, the garments which he wore would suffer a change. If he repented, they would again become clean. But if he continued in his wickedness until they were burned, his skin would suffer a change and he would become leprous, meaning tzara'at, not leprous and be set apart and exposed all alone until meaning being thrown out of the camp until he should no more engage in the conversation of the wicked which is raillery and slander by the way just again because i can't you know i have a big yates of that i can never control uh, we are living in a world and in a society and in a country where this is rampant the reason that we had the tragedy last week is all because of this kind of speech, which is continuing to this very moment. Now, on this matter, there is a warning in scripture which says, take, here, take heed in the plague of Tzara'at. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam, by the way. That is to say, consider what befell Miriam the prophetess who spoke against her brother, even though she was older than he and had nurtured him on her knees and had put herself in jeopardy to save him from the sea. Now, she did not speak despitefully of him, but erred only in that she put him on a level with other prophets, nor was he resentful about all these things, for it says the man Moses was very meek, very humble. Nevertheless, she was forthwith punished with leprosy at Sarat. How much more then does this apply to wicked and foolish people who are profuse in speaking great and boastful things? Therefore, it is proper that he who would direct his way aright should keep himself far from their company and speak not with them, that he not be caught in the net of the wicked and their foolishness. Now, the way of the company of the scornful and wicked is this. In the beginning, they are profuse in vain words, as in the matter whereof it is said, a fool's voice comes from a multitude of words. 
Then they go on to speak to the discredit of the righteous, as in the matter where it is said, let the lying lips be dumb, which speak arrogantly against the righteous. Then they become accustomed to speak against the prophets and to discredit their words, as in the matter whereof it is said, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and scoffed at his prophets. Then they go on to speak against God and to deny the very root of religion, as in the matter whereof it is said, and the children of Israel did impute things that were not right to the Lord their God. Moreover, it is said they have set their mouth against heaven and their tongue walks through the earth. What brought it to pass that they set their mouth against heaven? Their tongue, which first walked through the earth. Such is the conversation of the wicked occasioned by their idling at street corners and the gatherings of the ignorant and in social media. No, that's not what it says. Um, and in the feastings of drunkards. But the conversations of the worthy ones in Israel is none other than words of Torah and wisdom. Therefore, the Holy Blessed One aids them and bestows wisdom upon them, as it is said, and they feared the eternal, and they that feared the eternal spoke together, every person to their neighbor, and the eternal listened and heard. And a book of remembrance was written before God for them that feared the eternal and that thought upon God's name. And that's the end of his legal code on the laws of Tzara'at. So it's this whole extensive statement that you know, I've been trying to say in my own words, that this has nothing to do with medicine. This is from Dr. Maimonides. This is a divine uh, um, phenomenon uh, that's all about the evils of tearing apart society by the misuse of speech. Um, and pointing out all of the anomalies and all of the uh, uh, physical phenomena that make no sense in any kind of uh, uh, perspective from a, uh, you know, a, a physical, medical, uh, scientific uh, perspective uh, from Maimonides, the man of science of his time. It's, it's, okay. about, it's about boastfulness, about mocking. That, that, that's what we're talking about here. That's the it's, speech we're talking about. It's about antisocial speech. <clears throat> yes. It's about speech that will, in the end, tear apart society. All right. Um, so we'll stop for today. Yashikov to everybody. Yashikov. I uh, uh, hope we'll be able to come back next week. Stay